starting, starting. Yes. Okay. So we're going to go ahead. If you don't have the code, jot it down really quick. We'll get going. So this is chapter 43, behavioral ecology. And so I made a quick list of things I expect you to be able to do. Differentiate between innate and learned behavior that increase an organism's reproductive fitness. Can you describe circumstances where the environment is influencing your behavior, like a FAP, imprinting, habituation, learning time of day, seasons, communication, temperature regulation, resource availability, and changes which can induce mutations? Um, can you describe ways in which social behaviors can influence the fitness of organisms like cooperation and defense, finding food, reciprocal altruism, and have you done your highly suggested reading and thinking? Okay, so um, the first part that we spent, you know, quite a bit of time on was, is our behavior innate or is it learned? And what was our ultimate conclusion we came up with? It is both. Yeah, you have both innate and learned behavior. And what you want to be familiar with is experiments that you know of that can support evidence that some behaviors are innate and some behaviors are what? Learned. Are you awake today? Are you tired? Has today been a long day? Are you going to survive? Yes. Okay. So the we looked at lovebirds, we looked at snakes, we looked at snails, and we looked at twins. Do you remember all of those experiments? What were the lovebirds about? Nesting material and whether they got long and had it in their beaks or short and the rump. Good. What And remember, what did they do? They mixed and got a hybrid, and it did... Intermediate. I know you're saying both because it tried to put it in its. Yeah. Okay. Snakes, right? It. I know it sounds that looks terrible. I was trying to ignore it and move past it. Snakes. It had to do with whether or not they had an affinity for what? Slugs. Slug eating. Right. The coastal ones liked slugs and they ate them all the time, but the inland ones didn't. And what they ultimately realized it was the number of. Tongue flicks, because the tongue flicks determined whether if they had more tongue flicks, they could actually taste the presence of the slugs to know whether they were going to eat them. So it wasn't like they didn't like the taste of them or anything along those lines. It was that, hi, sweetheart. Yes. Okay. So um, tongue flicks, gay, if they had a lot of tongue flicks, then they were, were they knew that the, the slugs were present. But with fewer tongue flicks, they just didn't know they were there. So it wasn't like they didn't like the taste of them. They just weren't aware of their presence. Snails, do you remember a plissia in the water? And it lays what? Eggs. But it's a huge investment, time, energy, resources to lay all those eggs. But if they just gave them a shot of the egg-laying hormone, they would end up laying all those eggs even though they hadn't made it. And then remember the studies with the human twins, that horrible study where they kept the twins separate, but yet they had so many similarities. And then in your Ed puzzle, I showed you about that. So yes, the answer looks like a lot of our behaviors are in our genes. And then I gave you a whole slide um, conglomerate of that. What was this one about? We didn't talk about that one. What's that one? I mean, we didn't talk about it yet today. Mama Mouse and her, yeah, her mothering. Her mothering abilities. Remember, they've traced this to what's called the FOS B allele, where if that FOS B allele was missing or mutated, then if her baby mice, you know, went off, she didn't do the normal mothering behavior of getting them back under and covering them and keeping them warm. She just let them wander and she didn't care, right? So that was showing you that there was a gene for actual mothering. And then, do you remember I had you watch a video that had to do with stress? What did we find out about stress? Can you inherit stress? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lack of mothering increases your susceptibility to stress, right? And we talked about how you could overcome that and your issues with stress by what two things? Exercise, Exercise and meditation. meditation, okay? Am I saying something funny? Because some of you are laughing, so I'm starting to be self-conscious. Nothing's showing. I'm good? Okay. All right. Good on this one? What's going on? You're being quiet? Okay. Environmental influences. Normally, they're really nice. Environmental influences on behavior. What are they trying to do to this child? You trying to alter its behavior? Yes, by putting it in. And you're hoping that if you learn that you throw fits, you're in timeout, you're hoping to decrease 
the amount of fits that this child throws. What kind of be, what is that? It's a certain kind of learning. It starts with an A. Not adaptive. You said it. What is it? Associative learning. You're associating when I'm naughty, I get put in timeout. I don't get to play with my toys. I don't get to be with my family. I get in trouble. That is a form of associative learning. Now, there are many environmental influences on behavior, okay? One of those, okay, we talked about fixed action patterns. The behaviors are so complex, they almost look like they're, you know, would have to be learned, but they're not. And, but in your environment, if it's time to build a nest or you have made it, then you go through this whole complex routine. So something in your environment stimulated it, but then you're able to build that nest without any learning. We looked also at weaver birds and those complex nests that they build. And if something happens out of sequence, they can't fix it because they can only do step A, then step B, then step C. They can't go back and fix step A because it is a fixed action pattern. We looked at other fixed action patterns. So something in your environment, um, like around objects, which normally for a goose would be an egg. So it makes sense for them to have that adaptive behavior because if one of their eggs rolls out of your nest, you don't want to think about it. You just want to get that egg back in your nest. So they'll go through this complex behavior. But any round object will trigger and be like a sign stimuli for that fixed action pattern, just like um, with the stickleback. What is it that is the sign stimulus for the males to fight? Yeah, it's red. Doesn't even have to look like a male. If it has that red underbelly, it will do that. And we looked at mating dances and mating behaviors. And did I still write it? Remember that? Oh, gray crowned crane. Remember what it would do? Even though a female had killed all its babies, it would still mate with it if presented once its babies were dead, right? So those trigger those fixed action patterns, something in your environment. Now, if your response to your environment can improve, that's when you have learning. And what we saw as a pattern was that social interactions could assist in the learning process. Do you remember bird songs and what they found out there? What is it called when you hear at a certain time you learn something or learn how to do something or learn who your mother is? What is that called? A smell, perhaps. It starts with an I. Imprinting. Exactly. So we found imprinting. So there's a certain time when you could learn that song or you learn the smell so you can find your home stream if you're a salmon and go back to that same home stream. But what we learned is for birds, remember, as long as they had an adult tutor at any point, they could still learn that song later, right? So, um, but social inter interactions do assist with that. Okay, so we talked about imprinting. Um, then that saves you time because you're, you have an image of what, who your mother is, so you know who to follow. And also it helps you know later who to mate with because it would look like somebody similar to who you imprinted on when you first hatch. Habituation. Why is habituation adaptive? Do you know what habituation is and why is it adaptive? Go for it. They get used to it. You start to ignore a stimulus that's not going to cause you any danger. So you don't waste time and energy responding to that. Let's say you found a good place to eat, right? Eating more food could increase your fitness. But if you run away because you're startled by something, now you don't have that good area to feed. And so you learn, oh, I don't need to be concerned about this because they can't do anything to harm me. That is habituation. That's in your environment, right? That is in your environment. And so... It, it's not standard. It's not like deer will ignore people. But if there's a family who have deer in their yard all the time and they're always feeding the deer, I've seen TikToks where the deer walk right up to the guy's front door and he feeds them, they are completely habituated, right? But other deer might be startled right away if people are shooting at them, right? So habituation is a response to your environment, what to be afraid of and what not to be afraid of, right? When you were a little kid, were you afraid of dark rooms or your bedroom? Maybe you still are a little bit now. I don't know. You have become, that doesn't, that doesn't scare you anymore. You've realized it can't hurt you, so you're habituated. That's adaptive because then you're more alert to respond to something that could harm you. Okay. Then we talked about associative learning. 
And this is a change in behavior that involves an association between two events. And we had two types that we focused on. There are more than this. We just focused on classical and operant. With classical, you want to remember that the response, the behavioral response, is going to be involuntary and it's physiological. It's things like it might be shivering or salivating or secreting adrenaline because you're fearful or you know happy, whatever the cause may be. That's a physiological involuntary response. And that was what happened with Pavlo Pavlov and the dogs is that just the ringing of the bell since it preceded the presentation of food, pretty soon the ringing of the bell would cause the dog to increase their saliva production, whereas before it was the food itself. Um, and then operant conditioning, the response is voluntary. It is some mechanical motion or movement on your part. That's how they train parrots to ride skateboards. Or, you know what I mean? They're doing operant conditioning and it's always rewards and punishers. And so the way I think of it is perform this operation, do this task, and then um, you will get that reward. And if you don't do that task, like I asked, then you will get a punishment, okay? Check with the person you're sitting next to, make sure they're okay, and they can differentiate between those two. If you come home every day and beat your dog with a newspaper, what will it learn to be afraid of? Good. What kind of conditioning is that? What would that be? Classical if it's showing fear. And that's a physiological response, right? Okay. All right. Yes, sorry. Um, for the operant, the mice, like the example, what does the rat have to do to get punished? Oh, let's say it didn't do something in sequence. Like you have to learn how to push the buttons in sequence. Um, and then if you push the buttons in sequence, correctly, you get a food pellet. If you don't push the buttons in sequence, you get electrocuted. Yeah, yeah immediate um, reinforcement. All right, next we talked about, um, oh, I have this here, but it's fine. Um, so the next thing we talked about is, uh, or what I want to talk about now is your biological clock. And so that's an internal means of telling time. Um, and we talked about it being genetic. And the first one they discovered was the period gene, and that had to do with molting. Um, so that's your ability to tell time. Your circadian rhythms are behaviors that occur on a 24-hour clock. So you tend to be hungry at the same time. You want to go to the bathroom at the same time. You wake up at the same time. You get sleepy at the same time. Those are behaviors that are time of day dependent. Okay. And then... We can look at seasonal dependency, things like, let's see if it will go. Please don't seize. There we go. We, we talked about, there we go. We talked about migration and um, we talked about orientation versus navigation. Orientation is you're like, I know north, south, east, west. And then navigation, if you get disrupted or interrupted, you can refine the way you need to go. That is navigation. And then later in this chapter, we talked about why would you migrate at all? Let's just hit that one right now. Why would you migrate? Find better resources. What could those resources be? Mates and food. Yeah, mates and food. You know, you might have one area that's really good for um, getting a bunch of food. You might have another area that's better for raising young. And so you will migrate to that area in order to raise your young. Okay, um, next, um, we talked about observation and imitation, where you just watch somebody else and you repeat. It's not like it is still learning because you wouldn't know unless that was expressed in your environment, but you're just watching somebody else and doing that your, yourself, like making a good spaghetti. And then insight, that's aha. That's applying to a new situation using the skills that you have. All right, thanks, Nikki. Any, any questions on any of that? Okay. So next we talked about communication. And communication is influencing the behavior of another organism by how you're communicating to them. And we talked about the types of communication. And I want to reinforce 
you know, you want to analyze it. Is it a fast or slow? Does it get an immediate response or a slower response? And does it work in the night primarily, in the day primarily, or will it work in both? So we talked about chemical communication. Relative to the other forms, is it fast or slow? Yeah, yeah slow. Day, night, or both? Both. Auditory, speaking, barking, making sounds, and calls. What is that? Fast or slow? Fast. Day, night, or both? Both. Okay. Visual, fast or slow? Fast. fast. You know, you're watching me, re you know, right now, right? Day, night, or both? Yeah, usually in the day. There are exceptions to that. And then tactile, fast or slow? Fast. fast. Yeah, somebody's making contact with you. Day, night, or both? Both. both. And the one we talked about um, primarily is we talked about, we did talk about the V dance. But we also talked about how it can build community, it can be nurturing, it can show dominance with your tactile interactions or romance and love. The B dance was key because most of the times when we think of a dance, we think of it being what? Visual, but it is actually tactile. What two things can a B communicate while it's dancing? Direct, yeah, I heard it. Direction that the food is located in, re in relation to the sun so as the sun changes your dance is going to change because it's all relative to the sun and distance how does it communicate distance number of waggles communicates distance and that is species specific so a waggle for one species might be 10 feet you know each waggle so if you waggle four times that means it's 40 feet away for another one, it might be 20 feet. So if you waggle four times, it's now 80 feet away, right? Species specific. And then as far as the direction, remember going straight up the hive means if you do your waggle run straight up the hive and come around, do your waggle run again and come around. Straight up the hive means go outside of our hive and fly in the direction of the sun, okay? And then whatever angle off straight up, that means the sun is straight up. So if you go straight down the hive, then you're saying fly, yeah, opposite of the sun. What do you do when the sun's directly overhead? I don't know. Okay. Um, next, we talked about behavioral ecology and how natural selection shapes all of these behaviors we're talking about. Because if these behaviors are existing, they've been conserved, They've been maintained and they have been selected for. And we gave an example of that. I just tucked in a little foraging behavior. We talked and reviewed, though you already learned it, all the reproductive behaviors that are selected for. Um, and we also talked about um, cooperative learning, or cooperative learning, cooperative living, where you're living with other um species in your population and we talked about it having both advantages and disadvantages but we came to the conclusion that the advantages must what outweigh the disadvantages otherwise it wouldn't be selected for okay what you give up um, must not be so terrible because it is it is maintained and then within that cooperative learning we talked about how you can have signals to help protect and defend, and that raised the question of why would some of these animals choose to defend, right, instead of trying to mate, and we talked about altruism versus self-interest, and ultimately we determined these behaviors all fall back into line. It's all about what? Self-interest, yeah. That you're not actually gonna give up your fitness for another organism. When it looks like you are giving it up, you're probably giving it up for your own offspring to keep yourself alive, your own offspring, or your relatives alive. And who are your relatives? What do you call that? I mean, kin selection, right? Or you're giving it up not so bad that it kills yourself. You're giving up just a little bit of your fitness and your time because you know you're going to get what? In yeah, you're going to get paid back. And what do we call that? Reciprocal altruism. So when we looked at the meerkat standing and screaming, even though he's probably going to be the first one taken out, he's protecting his line, his genetic line. He's protecting his fitness because that gives his offspring or his relatives a chance to run away and hide. Okay. And we talked here that was this altruism? No. She volunteered as tribute because it was her sister, right? It all has to do with fitness. 
and we looked at the vampire bats and what they gave up a blood meal for somebody who didn't get one because they licked on in their cheek and they said, okay, I'll share it with you because they knew later that same bat would share with them if they needed to. And if they didn't share back, then they were going to be ostracized, right? And so that would make sure that you selected against somebody who wasn't being reciprocally altruistic. Does that make sense? All right. And then we looked at some behaviors that have to do with maintaining what? Homeostasis. A big one on that is temperature regulation. And we talked about uh, comparing, get myself over here, maybe, maybe, maybe. Okay. We talked about um, homeothermic versus poikilothermic. What's another name for homeothermic? Endothermic, and then a real cheesy name, warm blooded. Poikilothermic is ectothermic, cheesy name, cold blooded. Both of them, your enzymes are only going to work at a certain temperature, right? And so you're making a decision. Am I going to invest in insulating techniques? And then that allows me to um, live in a lot of different environments or not invest in insulating techniques. And then I can live in fewer environments. It's just two different strategies. We also looked at homeotherms and how they have an inverse relationship between body mass and metabolic rate. And we talked about how we could think about um, cell size, right? And remember what we learned about cells, that if you have a larger surface area to volume, which what kind of cells do, prokaryotic or eukaryotic? What ones? Prokaryotic cells, right? So they have more of that exchange across that cell membrane. So when you have a smaller animal like a mouse, they have larger surface area to volume. So if they're going to be a homeotherm, they better have a very fast metabolic rate in order to keep them what? Warm. And you don't have to do that if you're an elephant. Okay, so once again, that cost benefit analysis. All right, and then we just looked at a bunch of other adaptations. We looked at um, poikilotherms and how they can change their where they point towards the sun or on a sunny rock. We looked at plants um, growing towards the sun, different genes turned on dependent upon the environment, variations of water and protecting yourself. We looked at countercurrent in order to conserve heat or to cool oneself or conserve um, moisture or acquire oxygen. By having fluids moving in two different directions, then you can take advantage of molecules moving or temperatures moving from a higher concentration to a lower concentration in order to recover it. Otherwise, you're going to just even out, right? If you're coming in, think of it like this. If this one's coming in at 50 and this one's coming in at 100, if they travel, if they're concurrent and they travel together, right? If this one's coming in at 100 and this one's coming in at 50, then they're both going to end up being at what? What's the difference between 50 and 100? 75, right? They're going to split the difference. Do you agree with that? Do you understand where I am now? If I would have said 100 and 0, then it would have been what? 50. You there? Okay. You with me now? Right? But by going in a countercurrent, did I lose you? Do you need me to do it again? By going at a countercurrent, you're always... Um, facilitating the transfer of whatever you're after, like recovering water or getting oxygen, or sorry, yeah, getting oxygen out of the water. And then you had your hand up on countercurrent or anything? Okay, perfect. Then we talked about behaviors like to hibernate when you're low in resources, right? Then maybe that would be a good time for you to just chill out in a cave somewhere, conserve your energy until you have better access to resources. Or if not that, then migrate to where there are better resources and to invest in the energy it takes. Either way, it's an energy investment, right? Because here you have to build up the fat to withstand all that time when you're hibernating, or you have to build up the nutrients to actually do the movement. One or the other, you're going to have to do that, right? Um, what else? There's a lot in this chapter. Oh, mutation. That's the nuclear option, right? It's not working, so I'll go ahead and let my genes mutate. I won't correct it. And maybe, maybe I will mutate into something that is more successful for my current environment. 
And then that, my friends, is the end. Do you have any questions? Y'all get? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's do it simpler. Say you have a fluid coming in at 100, okay, and another one coming in at 0%. Then by the time you end, then you're going to have the 100 diffusing over until they're both at 50-50 because then they're at equilibrium, okay? But if your countercurrent, okay, if your countercurrent and this one is running, okay, let's say you're coming in at zero. Let's say you get by the time you go pass through here, you're at 90 you're still facilitating the transfer, right? And if before that you're at 80 and now this guy's down to 90, you're still facilitating that transfer. You're still picking up. That way you might, you know, this one's going to leave at 90 and maybe this one leaves at 10, but it came in at zero. Do you see how it's still facilitating the transfer? By running fluids in opposite direction. Okay? Yes. Your genetic legacy. Got it. So there is no real altruism. Exactly. Though you have a phrase, reciprocal altruism, right? So that's just been coined and that's what it is. But that's basically, I'm losing my fitness temporarily because I know you're going to repay that fitness to me. So since you know it's a favor, it's not really a favor if you expect something in return. If I bring you cookies, but I'm expecting you to give me cookies next week, it's not really a kindness because I'm expecting something from you. Yes. Um, to the probably the process, the ability to habitu habituate is innate, but it is in response to your environment, right? To what you're going to habituate to. You see the difference? What you're going to be okay with. Genetically, it's within you, just like you will habituate to a temperature. If you're in a room or in a hot tub like we talked about, um, it's really hot at first. And you're like hot tub, hot tub, hot tub, and it's very hot, but then you, would, you adapt to it. That is a form of habituation. So the ability to do that is innate, but it is still a response to whatever your environment is currently. Yes? Oh, it's any of your relatives. Yeah, your kin or your relatives. Anything else? Okay, you guys are awesome, Blossom.